that partnership with Beckham, it, I mean, can you, can you give us a sense of, of how, you know, so you're, you're obviously very, very close friends as well, and maybe that's a part of it, but it was telepathic pretty probably early on, given the yeah. hours and hours and hours. How, how did you work it out between you? It, it, it was just telepathic. It got to the point where I knew it. It got to the point maybe where perhaps the opposition in the end knew what we were going to do before we got it as well. But certainly in around that sort of 96 to 99, we were catching a lot of teams out in Europe purely through me being a decoy. Um, you know, he was the best passer and deliverer of a ball that I've ever seen. You know, I look at De Bruyne now and I think he's similar. Mm. Uh, just in that right channel, even feeding it into the striker's feet was unbelievable. And then your runs would start. Because once you get it into the striker's feet, you were in business. Because then the, the centre midfield players are running back, the wide players are running back, That they're, they're disorientated of where they are on the pitch. You start to make basically your runs forward. He'd get the ball, I'd go around him, he'd get a yard, he'd cross it. Or if the left back started to go close to him he'd pass it back past the left back to me I'd stop it and then roll it back to him for him to cross it and you couldn't stop it mm. you just couldn't you literally couldn't stop it for about three four years um, and it was telepathic but it's the same I think with everything I knew what Scholes was going to do I, when Dennis had the ball and he was about to pass it into Scholes I knew my run had to start because I knew full well he'd look over his shoulder and then that switch was coming to Bex and I'd be on my way. And it's the same probably with Teddy in terms of the sort of movements of where he was going to be if I was going to hit the second striker in particular. There were patterns that you just established. And interestingly, in that game we played 18 months ago or 15 months ago, the treble reunion game, those patterns were still there. Mm. <laughs> in that game, they were still there. You're still thinking, oh, that's what you do when, these play when you're playing with these players. Was it uh, surreal to watch your best friend or very close friend, not that any Man United player is anonymous, clearly, but was it surreal to watch Beckham become this phenomenon, like in, in, in fame terms? It, it just... Uh, I don't know, really. Um, I don't yes. Know, it's just yes is the answer. <laughs> it, 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 is, it, it is. It is now when you think now how big he is in the world. But just, he always... Yeah. Want, when, I'm, when I joked before about the Ferrari... He always had to. He always had to have. He always had in his mind that he had to be the very best at everything. He had to set a standard. He had to uh, set a trend. So if it was either his hair or it'd be fashion or it was car, you know, we got we all got given club cars at the age of eighteen, nineteen. I swapped my Prelude, which was a sports car, for a Honda Accord. Scolzi and Butty kept the Prelude, but he actually added leather and the bow speakers to his and made it the best Prelude in the car. But, you know, so he always had that sort of edge whereby he he wanted to be a star and he knew he wanted to be do things beyond football and beyond United. And I look back now, at the time I was disappointed when he left because I thought United would always be there for him. But when you think that he played for Real Madrid... Uh, Paris Saint-Germain, AC Milan, LA Galaxy, and you look at the experiences he's had and who he's played with, mm. there's no doubt he's done the right thing because he's obviously got an unbelievable... You know, it's, it's exper what experience he's had just by being bold enough and courageous enough to do the things he did and leave United, mm. which none of us would ever have done. We'd never have left our home city, our hometown, but he loved United, but he knew that he had to basically experience the world. And I always felt that that was, to be fair, something I never appreciated probably in him until after I finished and I went to, say, watch him at Real Madrid or I went to watch him in uh, in Paris or I went over to, say, Miami a few weeks ago and you think he's got a football club and this yeah. stadium's unbelievable. The, the training centre's out of this world and you think he's he's built that. He's done that himself, which is something that really is uh, a massive achievement. Teddy, you were coming in to say it was a bit surreal. Without a doubt. I mean, I, I knew him from, you know, breaking into the England squad uh, at a young age, you know, and, and to see him grow from this young lad. I mean, people see different people differently. And, and Gaz and Bex were two young lads when I, when I first met them around the England time and me joining United. And, and they, were, they were young kids setting out on the world of football to, to become better players. So to see him not outgrow United, because you, you can't outgrow United, but to see him go on to bigger and better things than United, and then to just be, you know, not just European-wide, but worldwide, globally, that he is a star wherever he goes, is just ridiculous, really. Mm. That, that young boy from Chinkford, that, that would just go on to the world stage as if he owned it. He's just, 
I know people have got to come from somewhere. Everyone says, oh, this young lad from where or this little girl from there. You've got to come from somewhere. But um, for him to go on to, to become this, this world icon is, you know, once you've been around him as a young boy, it's, it's quite surreal, really. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, when I look at him now and I think, do you know something? He actually, even if you go to his house, the design is immaculate. You know, if you just think about you know the clothes he wears or the design of his house or the way in which he looks, he just to me he's like um, he's got immaculate standards, and that was in his football as well. The way in which he struck a ball and pinged the ball, the technique was just perfection. It was like a, it, you know, most football players can ping a ball, but when some players do it, it just travels in such a way that it looks absolutely perfect. And his technique and his the design of his game, the design of everything that he did around him is it is it's the incredible quality and talent he has. And even to this yeah. day, when you see him, he mesmerizes you really in, in what he does. Yeah, without doubt. And you, you mentioned in the cup final there, the Champions League final, we, we definitely, I know he wanted to play centre midfield more often, didn't he? But when you took him off that right side, I wouldn't say right wing because he wasn't a right winger, a right-sided midfield player. When you took him away from that area, we lost something massively. And when England played him in central midfield, we lost something massively because he had a way of just feeding the ball in or curling it or bending it or drilling it or chipping it. Every, he could do everything with that right foot. And you know that if the defender was stopping one pass, he would be able to find you with a different pass. Mm. Or he would look at you to say, do something else because I can find you somewhere else. And, and it would just, you know, that, like you guys said, that last 10 minutes of the final, oh, hold on, you know, this is, this is where we work from uh, on this right side. And, and things came from there. Mm. If memory serves, I think you tried to shove him off that free kick against Greece in the last couple of minutes at Old Trafford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, we're losing two one against Greece for in a was it a qualifier or yeah. or uh, yeah. was it the last game of the the league? Anyway, we need, we needed. I thought we still needed to win the game. Anyway, so the the free kick comes about. I I won the free kick, and and. It comes at 20 yards out. And he'd already had about six free kicks. And he'd hit row Z, row T. He'd hit, the, he'd hit the wall. He'd shanked one. And it was like, Bex, Bex, I'll have this one. And he looked at me and went, Ted, you can't even reach from here. Get in the wall. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. You, you've probably got a point there, haven't you? And uh, got myself in the wall and watched it fly over into the top corner. And it was just... I've seen it a million times. Why was I even thinking about doing it? I, I could hit it one every 25. He could hit it 21 of 25 mm. on a good day. Yeah. And you knew that, you know, he'd, he'd found his range. If you want anyone on a free kick like that, leave it to him because you saw him practicing every day for that moment. That That's what he did. He was our free kick specialist at the time. Let him on it. And what a, what a uh, what a way to to get through to the World Cup? Yeah, Gary, just the last one on him. I mean, it's it's even f it's it was such a different time even. But like, remember, he, like he wears a sarong and it's like front page news. And you know, it, it, maybe because the way it ended, you you feel at some point he started on a collision course with Alex Ferguson, who didn't like everything that went with the fame. Was there an atmosphere in the dressing room of here, pull your neck in? You know, the the hair and the the, the building of the brand. Like that's not what we're about. I'm thinking Roy Keane and others. You know. There was the, the, at the time there was that because he was uh, he was tweaking the tail of the tiger basically. <laughs> you know, he was. Um, you knew that if he wore something or if he his his hair was slightly different or if he wore a cap in a team meeting. But do you know something? You think about individuality. The real problem, I think, that the boss had was that it was because it was one of the young lads. So, for instance, if it had been, say, Eric Cantona or sometimes Dwight came in wearing a cap or maybe Teddy had a Ferrari, that was OK because they'd been brought into the club and they were sort of different. Because he knew Be known Beck since he was 13, there was almost like this parental thing that sort of like it was he was going rogue. Um, he wasn't. He was the most hardworking, disciplined, professional, loved the club, you know, was obsessed with football. Mm. But he wanted to do some things outside of, you know, he was completely different than me. He was completely different than Scholes. He was completely different than Butty. Um, 
completely different than other lads in the change room. He would wear different things, but he was always like that. And I think that, to be fair now, we'd see it as individuality. We'd see it as character and personality, um, the ability to be able to do something that's different. You don't want everybody to be the same. So I think there was just a clash maybe that just purely down to um, the fact that the boss saw him as being, you know, his boy from from you know that he had in the change room at 13 when he used to come to the games and with his dad and his mum. And when the when he's 23, 24, you know, it, it, it's 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 different. And Bex was growing up, um, and I think he always wanted to go and play at Real Madrid or Barcelona and right. just great clubs in Europe as well. He always wanted those experiences. So I think it worked out for both in the end. But I think that the respect there was enormous between them both. Um, and it was just a case of, like you say, sometimes I'd be sort of there thinking, oh, that's going to annoy the boss. <laughs> and you just know it was coming. But then there's nothing you could do about it because it was just basically him being in his own individual character and what he is. 